Welcome back to another episode of Revealed Apologetics. I'm your host, Eli Ayala, and uh, welcome back. Uh, this I think we're doing back-to-back. -back. I had uh, Colton Carlson on yesterday to critique uh, mere Molinism and the work of Tim Stratton. And ironically, my guest today is a Molinist, <laughs> but we're not going to be talking about Molinism today. Um, I have my guest on to talk about a very important topic, which we will be introducing in just, um, in just a moment. Um, but all that said, let's kind of jump right in. I want to introduce my, my good friend, Eric Hernandez, and he can tell you a little bit about himself. He's been on the show before, uh, but why don't I just give, um, Eric here a moment to introduce himself to everyone. How's it going, man? Good. How's it going? Yeah. It's going well. Good. Tell, uh, folks, yeah, thanks. tell folks a little bit about who you are and uh, and um, what you do. Yeah, my name is Eric Hernandez. Uh, I'm the apologetics lead for Texas Baptist, uh, which encompasses everything from uh, three annual what we call the unapologetic evangelism conferences and uh, doing trainings with churches, uh, speaking on college campuses, doing debates and having discussions with fine gentlemen like yourself. Well, thank you so much for that. I'm very flattered. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, actually, Eric is a really good friend of mine. We've had uh, many conversations. He's one of my he's one of my many, but within the inner circle of people, I like to call on my forty minute drive home from work, where uh, we have some great conversations. And he's he's just a a good friend and an excellent apologist. I highly recommend before we kind of get started, if you have the ability to go over to, is it Eric Hernandez Ministries or Eric Hernandez, your YouTube channel? Just Eric Hernandez. Yeah. Right. So look, Eric Hernandez and subscribe. He's got lots of debates and he is uh, an excellent debater. And I know uh, folks who know us, I know uh, Eric comes from a more classical approach, a minor presuppositional approach, but I have learned so much from Eric. I think he does an excellent job, especially when discussing issues of, of atheism and things like that. I mean, he even has a debate on the topic uh, that we're going to be covering today, which is uh, um, abortion. So folks can um, maybe why don't you tell a little a little bit, uh, tell folks a little bit about that debate. Who was the person you debated? What was the topic? And maybe kind of a one or two highlights that can kind of wet people's whistles as they search for that later on. Uh, yeah. It, um, so I had a debate uh, at a secular college campus. Uh, it was at Lone Star um, College campus um, in Texas, and they have had up to maybe five campuses. And um, the long story short, a friend of mine had a uh, started a conservative group at the at the campus, and it's not a conservative campus. And the topic was on uh, is a, is it immoral to have an abortion. And I debated Heather Busby, who at the time was the executive director of Neo Pro-Choice, which is one of the biggest uh, um, pro-choice organizations. And uh, she was uh, she's also a lawyer um, and, and a feminist and whatnot. Um, yeah, I, I really enjoyed that debate. Um, I, I thought it went well uh, for me. Um, it was, but, it uh, was awkward. <laughs> Let's just say if, yeah. if, if I supported the other side, it was very uncomfortable. <laughs> I thought you did an excellent job <laughs> uh, pressing some of the important issues there. But oh, well, yeah, well, thank you. Um, and uh, I, I'll leave it to the viewers to interpret this fact. I just I just report the facts. I don't interpret them. Um, but uh, sometime after our debate, she was no longer employed with uh, Narrow Pro Choice. Um, uh -huh. But uh, yeah, there there are lots of great highlights. But I mean, I I, I expected her to bring a, a bit more to the table. Mm -hmm. um, and and to be fair, I mean, there's not much you can bring to the table when on this topic when you're representing that side. But you know, for example, in in one instance, um, she says something like, "We need to that we have an obligation to uh, care, clothe, and feed the children who are already here." And uh, you know, and I would just write down things she would say here and there. And sure. when it came to cross examination, I said, "Well." You said that we have this obligation, a moral obligation, to care, clothe, and feed the children that are already here. And I said, well, why don't we have a more obligation to the unborn to at least feed and care for them if they're not already here? And if they're not here, where are they? <laughs> of course they're here. They're just inside of a womb. <laughs> um, uh, and then one of my favorites um, was just kind of piecing together a few things she said throughout her opening. Uh, and at one point she said something to the extent that we should have – uh, equal rights across the board, whether you're gay, straight, transgender, homosexual, etc. And then later on, she said that uh, we have an obligation to support a woman's decision when they have an abortion, even if we disagree with that woman's decision, because at the end of the day, it's it's up to her. It's her choice. It's her decision. Sure. So in the cross examine, I just confirmed that she did say those two things. And I said, OK, I have a hypothetical question for you. Uh, suppose a woman of a particular religion approaches you 
and wants an abortion. And I ask that because she also runs uh, like a charity, if you can call it that, okay. that um, they uh, it's an organization that that will pay for a woman's abortion if they cannot afford it. So I said, let's say this religious woman approaches you and uh, let's suppose we have the technology that can not only tell you the sex of the baby, but could mm -hmm. even tell you the baby's sexual orientation. Sure. Now, um, so she comes up to you and she says, I just found out I'm going to have a boy or girl, but I also found out that my baby is going to be born gay and I don't want a gay baby. And so I said, now in this instance, would you still be pro-choice? Because if you say yes, then you're implicitly okay with killing someone just because they're gay. But if you say no, then you're going against a woman's uh, decision, which according to your standards should be respected and supported no matter what. Mm. So would you be still be pro-choice in this instant? Uh, she took a, a, a few seconds to respond and you know, kind of laughed nervously. And her response was, uh, that technology doesn't exist. And, and people laughed. And I said, well, of course, it's a hypothetical. Sure. I said, but let's, let's run with that. Uh, let's, let's suppose it didn't exist even in this scenario. And let's even take it a step further and say she was lied to by her pastor. Okay. Regardless of, of how she came to this, according to you, it is still her decision, her choice. And you said earlier, you have to support her decision even if it goes against, you know, what, what you personally would do. So again, would you still be pro-choice in this instance? Uh, she never answered the question and it, it was a really difficult time to even get this uh, uh, to happen at the school. That, that's a whole nother long story, but it was around that time that the person that was there from the school representing the school in the back was basically telling the moderator to move on to the next question or she's going to cut the mics off. Um, so okay. it, it was, it, it got uh, heated, uh, got heated, not in the sense that we're yelling at each other, but I mean, you could just feel the awkwardness. Sure. Um, but, but it, it went really great. And there were some other uh, interesting results of that um, from a, from a larger perspective. Um, the school de-recognized the organization that put this together and said, you can no longer meet on campus. Oh, wow. And basically my friend, uh, uh, took this quote to court, so to speak, with the Alliance Defending Freedom lawyers, the, those Christian lawyers who, uh, who who stand up in these kind of situations. And long story short, uh, the school was forced to, uh, first of all, put them back and recognize them as a student organization and to also make it equal for all organizations uh, across all their campuses. Because, for example, um, the school would give the student organizations a certain amount of money. And I think they gave my friend like maybe a thousand bucks a year. And he one day went to visit the like LGBTQ T group and asked how much do y'all get? And they got like 2,500 a year. So, oh. you know, there was some obvious bias going on. And now like, I think everybody got a flat, like, I don't know, thousand or something like that across the board. So uh, he upset a lot of people, but you know, everything was made, you know, uh, a fair mm -hmm. and equal across those groups. So, um, and then on the other hand, afterwards, I, I got to talk to a lot of young ladies and students um, <clears throat> of that, uh, at that came to that debate. And I had even some say that they came to that debate, either pro-choice or on the fence, but as a result of that debate, they mm -hmm. left pro-life. And, and wow. I mean, that was just really great. I got to talk to so, some other ladies who, um, two twins that, that were, no, they weren't twins, excuse me, two, two young ladies that were born in China around the one policy law. And long story short, they basically said, thank you for standing up for people like us. I said, what do you mean? And they explained their situation. And one of them was basically um, because, you know, in, around the time they were born in China, you could only have one child. And basically uh, parents would abort their children if they found out they were female because they didn't want a female and you could only have one. So it got to the point where doctors stopped doing ultrasounds um, because of the high abortion rate for female babies. So what mothers ended up doing was just having the baby at home to see and then decide whether or not they wanted to keep it. Hmm. One girl was left behind a dumpster and the other girl was left by a river, which was a river that was popular for just tossing the baby there. The river would sweep the baby away and there was no, you know, that way there's no crying or anything like that. You know, hmm. you couldn't hear the baby. And, and what that girl said was she, she says it was probably the case that my mom just didn't have the heart to throw me in the river. So she just left me by the river and it was like December where it was really cold. And by the grace of God, she was found by the police. And so many years later, uh, an American couple adopted him. And they said, if, if it, if it were up to people like the woman you debated, we wouldn't be here today. And, and that, right. I mean, gosh, I was in tears. So I got to pray with some people, talk to some people and it was really, it was really great debate. That's amazing. I definitely encourage people to check that debate out. Um, wh who was the other person? So how can people search that, that specific debate on YouTube? What would they type in in the search engine? 
Um, I think something like Eric Hernandez versus versus Heather Busby. Uh, there's a full debate, and then I made like a little highlight reel of okay. all my favorite parts of the debate as well. Okay, excellent. Now, um, I want to kind of approach this because, because this is, from a Christian perspective, there's a clear answer as to how we should view abortion. But I think it's, it's also appropriate to perhaps maybe kind of educate believers as to what our attitude should be when engaging this topic. Because I think because there is such a clear perspective from the, the Christian perspective. Um, some Christians tend to kind of shoot from the hip in terms of engaging uh, folks who are, are pro-choice. Uh, so what, what should be the mindset of the believer when they're engaging this topic in like various social settings? Uh, yeah, good question. There's, um, th there's a verse in Genesis 9. It's uh, Genesis, uh, let me make sure, Genesis chapter 9 verses 5 and 6, and it says the following. It says, um, and from each human being to, I would demand an accounting for the life of another human being. Whoever sheds human blood by humans shall their blood be shed. For in the image of God has God made mankind. Now, mm -hmm. what's interesting here is we find um, something revealing about, about uh, human life. And, and whenever you look at any law for any society or culture, the, the laws will express and reflect the values of what that culture upholds. Now, here we find um, God saying that anytime human blood is shed, whoever sheds human blood, then there's, a, there's a, uh, a, a, an allowance of capital punishment. Because basically, and the reason being is when you take someone's life, you're destroying something that, has, that bears the image of God. And mm. because of that, your life can be taken. Mm. That being said, when we when we talk about the question of abortion, really the, the one question that has to be answered to settle the question is – what is it that we're destroying or killing? Um, I, I like the way uh, I've heard Greg Coco use this illustration. He says, suppose <clears throat> you're washing the dishes with your back turned and your son or daughter approaches you from behind and says, you know, mom or dad, can I kill it? Well, your answer will not be yes or no. Your immediate answer will be, can I kill what? Mm. Um, you know, the roach, the spider, sure. You know, dog or cat, no. You know, brother and sister, definitely not. Um, so, Essentially, the only question we need, to, we need to answer is, can I kill what? What is the unborn? And uh, we can go to, to some quotes later, but essentially the way Coco puts it is that if, if the unborn are not human persons, um, then, I mean, really, the, why, why is this an issue? In other words, no one, no one asks permission to cut their toenails or cut their hair. And, and if abortion is not taking the life of an innocent, unborn human person, well, then – you know, have as many as you want, go for it. You know, I don't, I don't have a moral dilemma when I pull weeds from my garden. Right. Um, so the way Coco puts it is that if the unborn are not human persons, then no, he's, he's, if he says, he, yeah, if the unborn are not human persons, then no justification is necessary. But if the unborn are human persons, that no justification is sufficient. Um, so when it comes to that, if going back to the biblical perspective, if this is human life, well, then biblically speaking, God has a lot to say about that, sure. so much so that he told these people in the Old Testament, if you take human life, then your life can be taken specifically because uh, you are taking something that bears the image of God. Hmm. Um, another interesting passage, um, you in Psalms 137, uh, verse 8 and 9, um, I've heard Dan Barker quote this, the second verse, a lot. Okay. Um, and here's what the, what verse nine says. It says, "Happy is the one who seizes your infants and dashes them against the rocks." And of course, Dan Barker jumps on that and says, "This is uh, God condoning, uh, you know, killing babies or being happy about babies and how sick this is." Yada yada. Um, you know, if, if you would just read one more verse above that, <laughs> uh, you you see the context for this. So in verse eight, it says, "Daughter Bla Babylon." doomed to destruction. Happy is the one who repays you according to what you have done to us. Then he says, happy is the one who seizes your infants and dashes them against rocks. Now, what does this mean? Um, <clears throat> in, in these ancient times, when the Babylonians would uh, go seize a city, um, one of the ways, one of their tactics for, for not only taking over the city, but literally mocking the God that the city worshiped would be to grab the infants by the ankles and slam their heads against rocks because that, that was their way of saying huh. your God is so puny that he cannot even protect the most vulnerable among you. Hmm. So what, what the psalmist here is doing is reflecting back on the time when this happened to Israel. And that's why it says in verse eight, you know, um, 
you, you know, you came and did this to us. And then he says, you know what? One day someone's going to be happy to do that to you. In other words, you're going to be judged for this. God's mm -hmm. God's going to judge you for this. And one day, just like you did to our infants, someone's going to be happy to the, do that to yours. Uh, so so there's there's some lots and there's lots more to say just about the biblical principle. But at the end of the day, we're made in God's image. Um, you, uh, every life bears God's image. And, and there is no... Um, and we'll also get into this. It's not as if the image of God starts when you take your first breath or or at mm -hmm. this point and whatnot. Um, being a human being, a human person is a non degree property. Anyone who's heard me talk about the soul um, uh, will be familiar with that for those who are not. Um, in philosophy, you have degreed properties and non degreed properties. Okay. A degreed property is a property like being hard or loud. These are properties that can fluctuate or change and exist in various percentages or degrees. Uh, by contrast, a non degreed property is a property that cannot fluctuate or change. It's an all or nothing kind of thing. So the property of being even, you know, the number two and the number six are both even numbers. They have the property of being even. But the number six is not more even than the number two, because evenness is a non-degree property. It's all or nothing. Okay. Um, I would say the same uh, applies to being a human person. You, you don't gradually become a human person. Being a person, that property is a degree that you, a property that you either have or don't have. It's not a degree property, and and we'll get into unpacking that a little bit more later. So, all that to say, if the unborn are human beings, and if Christianity is true, which we, of course, would argue and believe that it is, sure. well, then every human life bears the image of God. Mm -hmm. And this is not something that we should take lightly. You know, there, there are some things, like if I'm on Facebook, there are some things, or even just in social settings, um, if I hear someone talking about something, th there, are, off, there are some times where I won't say anything just because, I don't know, I'm running late or I just don't think it's worth the effort to talk about. Or, you know, maybe it is a serious issue, but I know it, it's, it has so much um, political baggage to it. Uh, and, and sometimes I'll just often not even comment or or you know, speak up about some topics, and, and I won't mention which those are because I don't want anyone to take this the wrong way. Okay. But when it comes to top the topic like abortion, this is a topic I don't I don't think any Christian can be silent on. I, sure. I, I don't see how any Christian could be silent on this. Um, when you when you see this from God's perspective that you're destroying something that bears God's image. By all means, we should be we should be standing up and saying something about this. And and the truth is on our side, just like just like the truth of Christianity, the truth of God's existence, the truth of the soul. This the evidence, the uh, all the stuff that backs it up is on our side, and we we should be saying something about it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so you mentioned like the image of God. You mentioned these things of like value. What what happens when you know you have someone who doesn't believe in God, uh, and so they're saying, yeah, that sounds great, but I don't believe what you believe in. So stop trying to impose your beliefs on me. This should be my my choice. How, how would we interact with someone like that? Yeah, great question. So yeah, so now let's take it to to you know a perspective where we're dealing with with non-believers. Um, so in that debate that I had, you know, my my argument wasn't a quote religious argument, and that's that's something that's that's odd to me when I see um, you know, people saying, oh, oh, keep you know your your Bible, your religion isn't isn't an argument against <laughs> abortion or anything like that. Well, I don't. First, I don't, I don't need to use those, and nor do I expect the unbeliever to abide by the word of God. So sure. I'm not going to hold a believer to that standard. Um, second, you have atheists who are pro, pro-life. pro um, I, I, I know of an atheist uh, who's an acquaintance of mine. You know, we've met once or twice for lunch, and he's very much pro-life, and he's an atheist. So you can't say that these atheists are using biblical verses to be pro-life. Mm -hmm. um, on top of that, um, I always like to quote Braxton Hunter here, uh, who's friends of ours, and he says, abortion is not a political issue. It is a moral issue that has been politicized. Mm. So when it comes to abortion, I mean, depending on who you're talking to, first and foremost, for the most part, people are going to agree that human life is valuable. Um, I mean, gosh, just look at the the political arena and how much everybody is wanting to say that I'm valuable because I identify as this out of the other. Sure. Um, so there's something of value to human life. And even you look at the Constitution. I mean, we, we have this right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So that right to life. Um, and, and where do we get that? Well, it's, it's an undeniable right endowed by our creator. Um, that's again. Those aren't my words. This is you know, uh, uh, government here. Um, okay. So if if every human life, if human life has a right to life, if human beings have a right to life, 
Well, the question is, what is the unborn? Well, if the unborn are human beings, well, then it applies. I mean, it's that simple. It it applies that they have a right to life as well. Now, Mm -hmm. when it comes to the question of abortion, people can disagree on on different levels. Um, You can have, uh, for example, factual disagreements. And this is also good to to find out where the person you're talking to may disagree. Um, So, for example, uh, I have no problem eating a hamburger, right? I don't have problem eating, eating, eating meat. Okay. But um, but let's say someone in the East, or let's say of a Hindu religion or some uh, other religion similar to that, would have a problem morally eating meat. Or, or now, Alec O'Connor. Right. Yeah, North. sure. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you don't have to yeah. go to East. There are people here in the, you know, in, in the West. So. Yeah, well, well, this this will in particular apply to him, but yeah, that's I mean that that's right. that's a whole another uh, um, um, point to, to get at. But now, yeah. why why do people though these Hindus why would they have an aversion to eating meat? Well, mm-hmm. because they they hold to the moral belief that it is wrong to eat grandma. Now, you and I also believe it's wrong to eat grandma. So, in other words, we don't disagree about the moral values of the situation. We mm-hmm. disagree about the moral facts or the facts of the situation okay they believe eating a hamburger could be eating grandma because of reincarnation Mm -hmm. i don't believe i'm eating grandma because i don't believe in reincarnation hence we agree about the moral value don't eat grandma but we disagree about the facts of what is grandma or who is grandma um on the other hand you can have a um a difference of um, um moral values so, you know, one person may say, well, it is immoral uh, to take human life, whereas the other person may say, no, I don't think it is immoral to take human life uh, for any given reason. So there's a difference there would actually be a dif- difference of moral values. But then on, on a, a third level, you can have an agreement of the moral values, an agreement of the moral facts, and yet disagree about the priority. So we can both agree that the unborn are human persons. We can both agree it is wrong to take innocent human life, but then we would disagree on which right or which value takes precedence, the mm. bodily autonomy or the life of the unborn human person. Okay. And then that's where a disagreement can lie. So you can have a disagreement of facts, a disagreement of the moral values, or a disagreement of the priority of the values. Um, and, and that's kind of where I would start with someone when it comes to that question. Sure. Excellent. Well, I'm sure there's a lot to unpack. Um, I could I could technically um, ask a bunch of objections uh, as to how, how would a Christian respond to various arguments in favor of abortion. But I know that, that you have a presentation that actually will cover these in great detail and I think will be very beneficial uh, to people. I guess I only have one more question before we can get into that is... Um, what about people who, because I know it's not people who have abortions, they're not all like these like self-centered people that want to have, you know, a, a sexually liberated lifestyle and they don't want the responsive. There are people who actually genuinely have like um, health concerns, you know, that they know beforehand that if the baby is born, uh, the baby's going to have certain disorders that's going to make life very difficult for the baby. Um, and so when you, you have, um, you know, situations like that, how would we engage that sort of argument where someone says, well, hey, you know, I'm doing this because I'm trying to have the interest of the of the baby in mind. It, you know, the baby's going to be born with disabilities or it's, you know, it's things like that. How would we engage that? And then I'll, that'll be my last question before I allow you to kind of unpack um, your your presentation where you go into much more details as to how to navigate this uh, this terrain. Yeah, good, good question. So um, a, a few things is. Um, so first, l- let me say this too: is that you know w- what I'll be presenting, and you know, now keep it brief so we can take questions. Sure. Um, it, it can apply to anybody, Christian or not. In other words, you know, you don't have to be a Christian to use w- what I'm going to present. Um, sure. Now, w- what you're referring to is often about uh, the mother's health being at risk. Mm-hmm. Um, now, uh, well, or, Dr. The baby, Murph- or the baby, or, so it's the sure, baby, or the baby, right? Okay, yeah. So, um, well. Let, let, let me let me uh, answer these together, and then and then we'll we'll kind of separate them later. Because okay. essentially, um, I mean, you, you have, and I'm already kind of jumping ahead of myself. You, I mean, you have babies today who, you know, uh, I used to substitute at a school, and there were times where I substituted for a teacher who was um, a special needs teacher, and I saw everything from you know, kids who were just on the spectrum to kids who were. Um, in a wheelchair, couldn't move, couldn't talk, had to be fed through a tube. 
And, and they were just as much as a, of a person as I was and that just as much had a right to life. Um, did that make their parents' life much harder? I have no doubt. Absolutely. 100%. Mm. But then the question becomes, is, is inconvenience, if you will, uh, does that become a right or justification for taking the life of an innocent human person? And of course, we would say no. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, going back to the uh, um, the the mother's health at risk, uh, Dr. Thomas Murphy Goodwin. He runs the largest prenatal health clinic in the world, um, and he sees about fifteen thousand women a year uh, who are told by their primary care physician that if they don't abort their child, they'll have. Um, uh, and I wrote this, have this notation down, uh, that they will either die or have incredibly serious complications to their health. Now, he says out of the fifteen to 16,000 he sees a year, only one to two cases of that year actually require ending the pregnancy to save the mother's life or in, in uh, situations of grave health. I mean, okay. th this... In other words, it's it's this is not something that is like an epidemic that, that people think it is. Um, on top of that, you, you have... Um, Gosh, it was, and, and I'm trying to look for the statistic here. There was another instance where uh, it was a, actually a, an abortion doctor, I believe, and basically they said that out of all the um, abortions that they have performed, only about one percent of these fall mm. into that category. Okay, and, and that's a very, very. I mean, one percent is a very small category. Well, can I, can um, I step it, in real quick? I do apologize because yeah, I guess this, if we wanted to push it a little bit, sure. okay. So it's one percent. So in the cases of 1%, should those, should the par uh, the mother in that case have the right to choose to terminate the, uh, the birth in that 1%? Yeah. So good question. So it, here's where I would, um, differentiate between an abortion and, and something like this case. So first and foremost, we have to lay, we, we label actions as moral and moral, not just by what is going on, but by mm -hmm. the intent of the action. Okay. So for example, if, um, if a suicide bomber straps bombs to his chest and blows himself up, himself up, we call that a suicide. But if a soldier jumps on a grenade to save his fellow soldiers and comrades, we call that a sacrifice. Okay. So, the uh, in in any situation, the intent. So it, let me can I let me jump into my slides if you don't mind. Because yeah, well, yeah. I apologize if my question. No, no, it's okay. Ahead. If you want to jump into your slides, I can sit back and you can you can explain that unpack it because I'm sure your slides will answer a lot of questions. And I just want to encourage folks who are listening. If you have a question, like every show towards the back end, we we go through the questions, or or Eric in this case will be going through the questions. And uh, so please preface your question with question, um, because this will be a great opportunity to to ask your super duper hard question on abortion. <laughs> it's definitely a difficult topic to navigate. So, um, uh, so I encourage you guys to ask away, but go for it. So would you like me to share the uh, screen now here? Yeah. Okay, there we go. Okay, so um, let me just get this set up here. So here's my argument. Let's start with this, and then and then I'll finish answering the question. And this is why I wanted to get to my slide. So um, here's a, a simple syllogism: It is wrong, i.e., immoral, to intentionally kill an innocent human being as an end in and of itself. Now, the reason I specify it that way is because when it comes to these kind of cases, um, first of all, I think a lot of these cases will it'll be even less in the future because our technology is just increasing. But note in these instances, if, if it is, a, in other words, if you can, in, in some of these, okay, consider something like an ectopic pregnancy. This is where, uh, the baby, uh, um, is, is not in the proper place. It should be. I think it's in like the fallopian tubes. And right. if, uh, if the baby continues to grow there, well, I mean, the mother's going to die. You know, the babies aren't meant to develop in the fallopian tubes. They're meant for the womb. Now, a few things to say about that. First, if if the doctor could remove the baby and somehow put the baby into the womb, then obviously that would be the choice to make. In other words, we don't say in this instance, the mother's life's at risk, so let's just kill the baby. If you can save the baby, you save the baby, right? Right. Um, uh, now, that being said, most – I don't know the exact percentage, but virtually every time that these ectopic pregnancies are discovered, the baby's already dead. So it's just a matter of removing uh, uh, the dead baby from the fallopian tubes. Uh, in other words – now, here, here's an interesting thing is that on the medical rector, records, the doctor will label this as an abortion, and that's why I go back to 
it, it, the intent and really the uh, describing the situation is relevant to how we label something. Now, why would a doctor label removing a dead baby from fallopian tombs as an abortion? Well, because mm -hmm. now we can say, look, abortions are necessary. In fact, some go as far as to say that a miscarriage is a, quote, natural abortion. No, it's not. <laughs> uh, uh, it, it, when you begin to define words in certain ways, that's that's when it begins to get really really sus suspect to me. And, and and you can tell there's some kind of an agenda. Um, for, when Roe v. Wade was passed, not too long after, uh, it was Doe versus Bolton, I believe, which is not as popularly known. But, you know, some people will argue, well, look, abortion is only legal up until this point. Well, yes and no. Um, in that other case, uh, Doe versus Bolton, it, 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 I forget the exact wording, and, how, and I can look it up if you want me to, but basically it, it said that abortions are allowed at any stage if the mother's health is at risk. Right. And here's another reason this is important. A few sentences later, it actually defines what they mean by the mother's health, and mother's health ranges anything from physical health, emotional health, mental health, and implicitly even financial health. Oh, wow. So if I'm nine months pregnant, well, I will never be nine months pregnant, but if, if a person is nine months pregnant and they just feel, let's say, anxiety or, and, you know, the, the, here's another thing. Uh, uh, the doctor, first of all, doesn't even need to verify this. If, if a lady nine months pregnant says I am my my emotional health is at risk if I go to this pregnancy, well, then okay. then well, then there you go. The health of the mother's at risk and you can perform the abortion so legally. It's, simply, it's simply a word. If the person just expresses any of these things, that's enough to kind of go ahead with it. Yes, huh. exactly. Okay. Wow. And, and, and that's what a lot of people don't realize. Um, um, and, and here's the crazy thing is the doctor doesn't have to report this to anybody. And, and on top of that, the doctor she's talking to is not a psychologist. is not a therapist. They don't know how to assess whether or not this is actually the case. Sure. All they do is say, okay, well, your your health's at risk. Let's go through with it. And legally speaking, at any stage, they can perform the abortion. So the reason I say killing an innocent human being as an end in and of itself is because I'm trying to differentiate between the cases in which perhaps the technology is not yet there to save the baby versus situations where – let, let's just be blunt, either convenience or because they feel that they can't handle the situation as of not being able to handle the situation, whatever that means, uh, uh, justifies killing your child. Um, so premise one, it is wrong, i.e. immoral, to innocently kill an innocent human being as an end in and of itself. Um, and again, going back to what I said earlier, I would not label these instances where you're removing the baby to save the mother's life as a, quote, abortion, just like I wouldn't label a soldier jumping on a grenade to save his comrades as a as a suicide um the intent is to save the mother's life and the doctor should do everything they can to save the baby's life and if they can't it is an unfortunate byproduct of saving the mother's life but it is mm. not the intent and end to kill the the child's life and that right. is the difference okay right. so premise two um abortion intentionally kills an innocent human being as an end in and of itself Therefore, abortion is morally wrong. Now, um, <clears throat> I mean, just plain and simple. I mean, I think when it comes to the question of abortion, and let me let me not be too cold hearted here. I, I think it's an easy question to answer intellectually, but not an emotionally right. easy question to accept. And there's a difference. Um, you know, as as apologists, philosophers, you know, there's instances where you're like, yeah, this would be the moral thing to do, even if I if I may feel uncomfortable about it. Um so intellectually, I think we can answer that. Emotionally, it's where really the problem uh, lies. But here, here's where we're going to look at kind of what I've already started talking about. Um, so the question again being, what is the unborn? <clears throat> here's a, a quote from an embryology textbook. It says, the development of a human being begins with fertilization, a process by which two highly specialized cells, the spermatozoon from the male and the os oocyte from the female unite to give rise to a new organism, the zygote. Now, this is clearly stating, and this is this is not a religious text. This is not a an anti-abortion book. This is embryology 101, if you will, stating mm. that that from the beginning, from conception, you have a new living human being. This is what the science tells us. Um, here's another uh, um, 
uh, another textbook on embryology, it says a zygote is the beginning of a new human being. Human development begins at fertilization. This highly specialized totipotent cell marks the beginning of each of us as a unique individual. Once more, I cannot stress enough, this is an embryology textbook right. that people studying this will read. This is not something that that is, you know, comes from propaganda. This is just pure science. Uh, now, here's where it gets a little interesting because, you know, this is this is. In other words, the, these were neutral books, if you will. Now, let me quote some from some pro-abortionist doctors. Uh, Warren Hearn wrote a book called Abortion Practice. Um, the last I heard, this is the only textbook on abortion that has a single author, and it is a, a textbook on how to perform abortions. So this is an abortionist speaking here. And he says uh, in the beginning of the book, we have reached a point in this particular technology where there is no possibility of denying an act of destruction. It is before one's eyes. The sensations of dismemberment flow to the forceps like an electrical current. Mm. Again, this is a, a this is a textbook on performing abortions. Um, right. Make I mean, just being as blunt as possible. Um, Ronald Dworkin, also an abortionist, wrote this book. And in his book, on like the first page, uh, one of the first sentence or two, he says, "Abortion, which means deliberately killing a developing human embryo." And later on in the same sentence, it says this is a choice for death. So they make you know no no hesitation to, to admit this. Uh, an, another uh, popular pro-abortion advocate says, "I have always frankly admitted that abortion Wait, I'm is stop murder." You in the middle of the quote, this yes. is a pro-abortion quote. Yes. Okay, Camille Pagilia Pagilia. I forget how to pronounce her last name, but she's uh, she's a huge advocate in this. And in fact, she I don't know if it was her or or the other one who was saying we got to stop saying this is not a human being because it's only hurting our case. Mm -hmm. um, well, let, let me read, finish the quote first. She says, "I have always frankly admitted that abortion is murder, the extermination of the powerless by the powerful, which results in the annihilation of concrete individuals and not just clumps of insensate tissue." Wow. One abortionist says we have to stop pretending like we're not killing a human being because what's happening is, uh, you know, these people are looking at ultrasounds. They're looking at these pictures of their babies, and it's clear it's a human being. And mm -hmm. when we argue that it's not a human person, we only hurt ourselves. Let's just state up front it is and go from there pretty much. Wow. Um, so. Um, well, you've heard me talk about this, you know, in America, if you kill a bald eagle egg, you get fined, uh, $10,000, an unhatched, a not fully developed bald eagle. How much? Ten, ten thousand dollars Wow. $10, I didn't, I didn't know. Okay. Wow. That's a lot. So, so yeah, in America, if you destroy a bald eagle egg, again, an undeveloped, unhatched, still developing bald eagle embryo, you'll get fined up to $10,000. But consider this, if you're a mother and pregnant, and you want an abortion, not only will you not get fined, we want the government to pay for it and fund it. Wow. So here, here's what's sad is when you think about this, and I'm not trying to make an emotional argument here. I'm simply saying let's look at this objectively and see if this even makes sense rationally speaking. Um, you would think that the safest place for an unborn child to be is in their mother's womb. I mean, it should be. That should be the safest place. It's it's a place that God created for them to develop and be safe and protect it. But sadly, in this country, the safest place that a child could be is in an unhatched bald eagle egg. I, I, I mean, you know, let that sink in. If you're in your mother's womb, you can be killed, and the government can pay for it. But if in your, but if we put the babies in bald eagle eggs, they'll be safe. I mean, this is so. You know, I'm trying not to curse her. This is so backwards. That's like, like, my goodness, this is a rationale of our country here. Um, now, some, now here, here's, let, let's get into the case here. <clears throat> Anytime I talk about abortion, um, I always use what I call the sled test. Because first, we have the science that says this is an unborn human person. It's human life from the beginning, from conception. Um, this is in the medical textbooks, and this is admitted openly by the doctors and and and. Uh, pro-abortion advocates and doctors who perform abortions. So someone may say, okay, but there's a difference between a baby in the womb and a fully developed human person. And yes and amen. Yes, there are differences. However, here's a question. Although there are differences between you at this stage and you as an adult, the question becomes, are these differences 
significant justifications for killing you inside the womb, but not killing you outside the womb. Mm -hmm. And here's, we come to what's known as the uh, sled test. Um, I, I wrote the name summer, the guy who came up with this, but here's a sled test. Um, it is, it is an acronym that stands for size, level of development, environment, and degree of dependency. <clears throat> now, basically anytime I go, um, in fact, on my YouTube channel, I, I have a video on this where I'm speaking at a secular college campus. And I said, any, any arguments you give me in favor of abortion, I'm going to tell you right now the approach I'm going to take. Any argument for abortion is going to fall under one of these four categories, size, level of development, environment, and degree of dependency. And really, these are the four, these are the four main differences um, that, that stand between us in the womb and us outside the womb. So uh, it's it's Dr. Stephen D. Schwartz, and he says there are only four differences between you as an adult, you as an embryo, and you as an adult. But as we'll see, none of these can justify killing you inside the womb, but not outside the womb. So well, let's kind of go through these one by one. Feel free to stop me at any point, by the way. Sure, no, you're on I'm a roll. This is super helpful. <clears throat> so <clears throat> size. Now, um, depending on who you talk to is going to depend on how they, you know, provide this argument, but let's just, you know, take it at face value here, science. Um, so the unborn are obviously not as big as us and adults while they're in the womb. But here's the thing. Um, can we, can, can the bigger person kill the smaller person? No, of course not. In fact, men are typically larger than women, but does it follow that men can now kill women? No, obviously not. Well, if that's the case, then we shouldn't allow it for this one either. Um, in my arguments for the soul, um, I kind of make a similar argument about grounding personhood. And, and I say something like, uh, if, if we ground value in being a person, being a human person, and if if being a human person is grounded in our mass and matter, well, the same principle applies. Men typically have more mass and matter than women. But then the question is, does having more mass and matter mean that you matter more? Well, obviously not. Um, so regardless of your size, if you are a human person from conception, size is not a justification for killing you inside the womb, but not outside the womb. Mm -hmm. um, level of development. Um, <clears throat> again, this can, can come out in a number of ways depending on the person. But l let, let's look at development. Is, is this a justification? A toddler is more developed than a child in the womb. Uh, but even then, a 10-year-old is more developed than a toddler, and still a teenager is more developed than a 10-year-old. But notice that none of these at this stage of development can kill the first one or kill the previous one. However, if you become this one, well, then now you can kill that one. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, it, it, that's, it, that's really the rationale behind it. Uh, um, I, I know I'm saying it bluntly, but I mean, you look at the arguments. Uh, um Okay, but we'll, we'll let, let, let's push it on from here. So here's what people may say. Okay, but hold on. There are significant differences within the stages of development. For example, um, some may say, well, the unborn can't feel pain. That's a difference. And then some say at a certain point in time of development, the unborn are not conscious. So right. let's take this. That was, um, um, that, that was my question, but I was like, you know what? He's probably going to get to it. So, and you, that was literally my next question. <laughs> that's an argument that comes. It's like the, con the yeah. consciousness hasn't fully developed. And, you know, that goes into how they're defining what is constituted uh, uh, as a human being and when it's appropriate yep. to do this, that, and the other thing. So go for it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so scientifically speaking, I just want to reiterate, uh, uh, it is a human person from conception. It is a human being from conception. It's living, it's growing, it's developing. It, it responds to stimuli in its environment. Uh, um, so, and, and it's, it's a separate entity, if you will, from the parent. Um, so we, we know it's a living human being from conception. It's just the level of development. And here's another thing I want to say is, and this, again, this ties in, you know, with, with arguments for my, for, for the soul that I often give is that your your function does not determine personhood. Uh, mm -hmm. If anything, that you have the functions that you have because of the kind of thing that you are. You, you don't become something by gaining functions. You have functions because of what you are. Um, so the, the first time we met, we talked about acorns. So if you don't mind me bringing that uh, <laughs> using the illustration. That's again. a legendary, that was a legendary <laughs> conversation. <laughs> <laughs> so um, if, if I plant an acorn in the ground, it has a capacity to grow a root system and become a tree. But if I plant you in the ground, you will not grow a root system and become a tree. Why? Because it's not within your nature to, to grow a root system. In other words, the functions and abilities that a thing has is grounded in its nature. So we don't 
um, we don't say that losing certain functions means you've lost your nature. It just means you have lost uh, abilities that are grounded in your nature. So I can put it this way to get a little more technical. Um, you have actualized capacities and you have ultimate capacities. So when my son is four years old, you know, he he's he can he can speak, but he's still working on his grammar, right? He's still working on on putting sentences together in a, in, in a grammatically appropriate way. But a few years ago, he couldn't let's say he couldn't talk at all. Well, he still had the ultimate capacity to be able to talk. He just needed to develop other capacities to actualize this ultimate capacity. A different way to put it is I have the capacity to speak English and Spanish, but I don't have the capacity to speak French. So we can say I have the first order capacity to speak English and Spanish, but I have the second order capacity to develop this ultimate capacity to speak French. In other words, I have the capacity to develop the capacity to speak French. So it's a latent capacity that is just not actualized, but I can do that because of the kind of thing I am. Now let's go back to this. Um, when it comes to uh, a consciousness, if you have a human person, then by the, in virtue of having a, a human nature, this, this, this individual has a capacity to be conscious the ultimate capacity to be conscious, it just may be the case that it's not actualized. But let, let's let's put it this way. Um, take someone in a coma. If a justification for killing someone is that they're not conscious, then by that standard, you can kill someone in a coma because they are allegedly not a human person or however the person is arguing the case. Uh, on top of that, what about the pain thing? Here's what's interesting. This little girl, her name is Gabby Gringus, and she has a very, very rare condition it is known as the uh, congenial insensitivity to pain. And basically from birth, she cannot feel pain. She feels no pain at all. Wow. Uh, the reason she's wearing glasses, I think one of her eyes might be fake. Um, now, mind you, that there's really no way to detect this at, uh, um, you know, in the womb or even at birth. Uh, unfortunately, at least we don't have a way to detect it yet. And what would happen is she began to – she would have an itch in her eye. One time her, you know, her parents saw her and her eye was like gouged out because she had an itch and she just kept scratching. Again, she doesn't feel pain. So she literally made herself blind and they had to put glasses and goggles on her to keep her from scratching her eyes. Wow. Um, when she was teething as a baby, she began to chew on any and everything, metal, wood, rocks. And she would just start to break her teeth and mess up her gums because, again, she could not feel pain. On top of that, she began uh, – uh, there's an article I, I've read on her, and her mom said that she would chew her tongue like it was bubble gum. Oh, my god. And goodness. her mouth would just be full of blood. Cannot feel pain. So according to the standard of, well, they can't feel pain or they're not conscious, well, the moment someone like this goes into a coma or you have someone like Gabby Gringus, well, then all bets are off. Go for it. Because according to this argument, that if, if the unborn are not conscious or can't feel pain, we can kill them. Well, here's a candidate. Or to, again, take someone to coma, take someone to sleep. However, you want to hash that out. You, we we clearly have this reductio ad absurdum with this. Sure. So, more to say there. Level development, environment. Now, <clears throat> here's here's another uh, uh, category of arguments. Is uh, oftentimes, you know, when when you really talk to someone at the end of the day, the argument seems to be, well, they're not born yet, which alludes to the environment for the unborn. Now, okay. imagine this again. Your function does not determine your value or what you are. So your environment, essentially, let's say it's your location. If I if I drove 70 miles you know, somewhere, let's say I went to your house and it's 70 miles away. It's not. It would be nice, but let's say it's 70 miles away. <laughs> if I drive 70 miles, does that change the kind of thing I am? No. Um, as you know, uh, one of my dirty little secrets was uh, before I got with Texas Baptist, I used to dumpster dive, right? Um the, these retail stores would throw away perfectly good in the box new stuff, and if you knew when to go, you can go in the back, and you know it's not illegal, and in, in, at least not in this state. Um, and you know I would pull out these perfectly brand new items from retail stores, and I'd you know sell them in a garage sale on eBay. And interestingly, <laughs> I used that as a way to provide for my family for some months. Okay. But note that, like for example, I found uh, you know I'd find office chairs, desks, um, all kinds of equipment. I, I found printers. Wow. But note that just because it was taken from the shelf and put into a dumpster, it did not change the fact that it was a printer hmm. because the location did not determine uh, the kind of thing it was. So if driving 70 miles doesn't change my location or value, well, then how can we explain 
traveling seven inches through a birth canal, how does that change the value? Yeah. Or what this 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 unborn child is, it's a human person. Mm -hmm. So let's put it this way. <clears throat> Suppose you have you uh you have this um doctor's office and to the right of the room you have this uh um mother at 21 weeks pregnant and on the other side you have a mother that just gave birth at 21 weeks now the reason i say this is um because we'll get into this with the next one as well uh the the level of viability um is also an argument you would hear well you know abortions are, are legal only up until the baby is, is viable which which we've already talked about how that can be how there's wiggle room and loopholes to that uh to that that restriction of when the abortion can occur but in texas um when i when i first gave this presentation i think the earliest that a baby was born and lived was at 22 weeks but not too long ago, there was a baby born in uh, what well, may have been in Texas at uh, 21 weeks and four days. Oh. So that is like the, you know, the record. Of course, no one's trying to beat the record, but that 21 <laughs> weeks and four days and the baby survived. Uh, now, <clears throat> let, let's you have here, let's say 21 weeks on the right side, 21 weeks in the womb on the left side, 21 weeks develop outside the womb. Now, imagine a doctor walks into the room. If the doctor kills the baby on the left side, he goes to jail. But if the doctor kills the baby on the right side, he gets paid for doing his job. What's the difference? Location, the environment. One's in the womb, one's outside the womb, but they are at the same level of development. Well, what if they what if they say that well the, the difference is that one has the consent of the mother who should have a right over that decision, and the other doesn't have a consent of the mother who has a right to that decision. Yeah, so so that's um, I, I'll I'll touch more on those kind of things towards the end, but let let's address this okay. here. Okay. Um, so if if a doctor, okay, let let's say this doctor is um, you know, has a consent of of the mother, and on on the mother's way to the doctor's office, let's say the doctor's running late, and let's say he's a little bit drunk. Um, and he's running late, so he's speeding, and he coincidentally happens to come at the same stoplight of this pregnant mother going on her way to meet him for an abortion, and he runs a stoplight, hits her, and ends up killing the baby. This woman can legally sue him for man vehic vehicular manslaughter for killing her baby, when just 10 minutes later, he would have gotten paid for doing it within a doctor's office. Wow. So – <laughs> yeah, you put them um, in those weird scenarios. The point comes across. You don't really yeah. think about it at first until you kind of come up with these interesting scenarios to test the consistency of the standard. Yeah. I think that's 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 important there. <clears throat> yeah. So, okay. So environment, obviously not not a justification. Degree of dependency. Here's goes back to viability. Um, so here are three human beings that each have a, a degree of dependency on someone else for their continued existence. Which one of them should we kill first? Or how about this question? Which one can we legally kill? Well, just one. This right. one. Um, it, it, the degree of dependency is also, uh, it's, it's such an absurd, arbitrary standard <clears throat> because really degree of dependency has nothing to do with value or what you are. Again, the science is clear. You're, human, you're a human being from the beginning. Uh, um, level of viability has nothing to do with either of those two things. And here's what's interesting, because you know some people argue, well, we can have abortions up until the age or level of, a vi of viability. Well, in America, that's, a, that's about 21 to 22 weeks is the, uh, lev um, um, the development of viability, age of viability. I'm thinking age of accountability. I'm confusing these. <laughs> level of viability. <laughs> that happens um, in theology along with all yeah. this other stuff. <laughs> yeah. So level of viability, 21, 22 weeks in America. But if you go to the Middle East, like in Bangladesh, the level of viability is at 38 weeks. Hmm. So here's another one of those peculiar situations. If it's only legal to have an abortion up into level of viability, then suppose you have a woman in Texas who is 22 weeks pregnant. Legally speaking, she cannot get an abortion and let's, you know, set aside the health issue. She can't get abortion legally. So she hops on a plane, flies to the Middle East, goes to Bangladesh, and now the level of viability is 38 weeks, and now she can legally have an abortion. 
In other words, the level of viability is not a degree of value or personhood. It's really a reflection of our technological abilities. Mm. It has nothing to do with anything that's relevant to whether or not we should be killing these innocent human beings. So um, on top of that, uh, uh, there, there's a, there's an alliteration uh, phrase. It's um, it's blood, breast, or bottle. Um, any any child is going to be dependent on one of those three things: blood, breast, or bottle. It just depends on what level of development in the womb. Obviously, but blood when the baby's born, breast, and and um, soon after that, bottle, because at all these stages, this baby is going to depend on on its mother to because it can't feed itself. So it's not as if when the baby's born, automatically it's just independent and able to survive on its own. Because and that's that's how you'll hear it phrased oftentimes. Well, up until the baby can survive on its own. Name me one baby that comes out of the womb and like goes and gets a job and survives on its own. Right. Uh, um, my body, my choice. You know, they'll say, Well, well, the baby's using my body. Well, sure, the baby is, but when the baby's born, it's still gonna use your body. I guarantee yeah. you, ask any mother, you know, your wife, y'all, y'all have some kids. I guarantee yeah. you when the baby was born, she, she's like, okay, I'm free. You know, I could just sleep as long as I want. Don't have to feed. No, <laughs> right. the baby is still yeah. using your body, your right. energy, your time, your money, et cetera. So I know of no baby that pops out of the womb and is just independent unless of course you're this baby. Um, <laughs> but other than that, I, I know of, of no I, I, I don't interrupt you. Your slides are awesome. <laughs> <laughs> like when you have your little scenario, suppose there's a doctor and then magically your doctor just pops up on the screen. <laughs> That's re re very well done. I, I, I appreciate that. I'm sure it's a no, no. Vi visually stimulating for those who are watching. So, well, thank you. So, so not this. So, uh, again, just to, to reiterate, kind of recap, you have mm -hmm. four differences. According to Dr. Steven Schwartz, there are only four differences between you as an embryo and you as an adult. And sure. none of these differences justify killing you in the womb, but not outside the womb. Um, now, with that being said, and, and here's where, you know, I just open it up wherever you want to go from here sure. is um, the next tactic I use when discussing this is, is what I've heard called trotting out the toddler. Mm -hmm. um, any argument that you give me in favor of abortion, I'm going to quote trot out the two month old toddler or the two year old toddler. And I'm going to say, let's take the principle of the argument you just gave me. And let's apply it to this two-month-old toddler. Can I use your argument to kill this toddler? If the answer is no, then it cannot apply for abortion either. Hmm. So here, here's an example. Um, suppose <clears> – <throat> let, let's take the main ones. Um, the main uh, – and I can stop sharing here. Okay. Let, let's take the, uh, the main argument. Here's an argument. Uh, let, let's say um, you know babies deformed or deformities or something like that. Uh, well, let's say this mother has a two month old baby and on the way home gets in an accident and the baby comes deformed, mentally damaged, etc. Can she kill this baby? No. OK, well, why can you do that inside the womb? Well, they might say, well, because it's in the womb. Well, what's that? Well, that's environment, right? D doesn't work. Uh, well, it's not as developed. You know, in other words, you go through that that sled test um, or how about this? What about in cases of rape? And again, intellectually speaking, the answers are easy. Emotionally, this is where it can get difficult for some. Sure. Um, you know, just like the emotional problem of evil and the logical problem of evil. Yeah. Um, the, the logical problem of evil is solved. You know, Alvin Planica is accredited for solving that. But when it comes to the emotional problem, well, that's a case by case basis for each person. Um, so let's say in cases of rape, um, they say, well, you know, I don't, I don't want to, you know, every time I see this baby, I'll have this memory, this and that. Well, killing the baby is not going to take away the memory of the rape. Mm. And, and the problem is not, that she's pregnant. The problem is that she's raped. Uh, the problem is not the baby. The problem is rapist. And ironically, I've heard people say, well, you know, I'm totally against capital punishment. Well, what about if a rapist, what about if someone rapes a woman? No, I'm not in favor of capital punishment for that either. Oh, okay. So, so you're against capital punishment, even in cases of rape, unless of course you're the baby, then you're for it. I mean, seriously, mm -hmm. you know, like we're, we're going to kill the baby anyways. Yeah. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, poverty, same thing. So here's what I like to do. Um, I say, let's take all of these and put them into one scenario. Um, you know, uh, suppose t tomorrow I get fired. Uh, let's say hypothetically, you know, um, Leighton watches this and he's like, you did a horrible job. We're going to let you go. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> so, so I get fired. And then uh, on my way home, you know, I, I look at my bank and somehow someone hacked into my bank account and took all my money. 
And then on top of that, when I get home, you know, I find out that, you know, my wife and children, God forbid, knock on wood, knock on the Bible, whatever, you know, th uh, they got in a terrible car accident. And, you know, my, my children are disfigured, dismembered, you know, there's some, some brain damage. And then when I see my wife at the hospital and, you know, she comes out of her coma, she says, hey, I might as well tell you, you know, these children aren't yours. Let's even say, you know, she was, she was raped X amount of years ago and these, these children aren't yours, but I've never told you. Wow. Now you have rape. Let's even say it was by a family member. You have rape, incest, poverty, dismemberment, anything else you want to throw into the scenario. Can she or can I kill my children? No. Well, then why do we allow it inside the womb? Yeah. Right. Um, because, and, and I've heard people, you know, and, you know, emotionally speaking, I, I had one lady, you know, try to really, she just doubled down, but <clears throat> she just doubled down and say, well, if a woman is raped, how can you force her? Yada, yada, yada. I know of someone personally, excuse me, that was, um, I know of someone personally that was raped and didn't know it till later. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, especially with, you know, the date break drugs and whatnot. And this person told me that, you know, she got in a fight with whoever she was with at the time. And, uh, she went out, you know, whatever, had some drinks. And then the next day she woke up in someone's house, didn't know whose it was, but, you know, just kind of left. Um, <clears throat> or it was a friend's house, something to that extent. And when she went to the female doctor about a month or so later, I don't know how long it was, you know, as they were examining her, they said, you know, I, I thought you said you haven't been intimate with anyone. She said, no, I haven't. Well, it looks like you have, you know, when was the last time it was this long ago and says, well, what happened around, you know, basically she explained the situation and the doctor said, well, I, I hate to break it to you, but you were raped and she didn't know it. Wow. So, um, that being said, to to the person who is just emotionally like in my face, but if a woman's raped, you're going to force her X, Y, and Z. You, you don't care about the woman. Well, let's say that this a similar situation happens. Uh, she, uh, this woman gets in a fight with her husband, goes out to a bar, you know, gets a little promiscuous, but then you know blacks out. Next day, wakes up. Let's say in her car. Um, she doesn't know that anything bad happened that night. She goes back home to her husband. They, they forgive each other, they make up, there's intimacy, and she conceives. Nine months later, she has a child, and the child looks nothing like the husband. And she finds out quickly, she was raped that night, she just didn't know it. So now she has a child that is already born, that was conceived and birthed from rape. Can she kill the child? And when I was talking to this person, they said, no, she can't do that. Why? Because it was born. Well, wait a minute. I thought your argument was that you cannot force a woman to live with this experience by having the child. Well, she's already had the child and later find out, found out it was because of rape. Why can't she kill the child if your argument is about caring for women, not forcing them to have babies that were conceived by rape? Right. I mean, it, it's, it's, consistent, it's inconsistency. So a lot of their arguments might have emotional punch to them, but they're actually in, they're, they're not consistent with their own standard. And, and bringing yeah. up these weird illustrations that you're bringing up is just what we do in logic when you do what's called a reductio ad absurdum. You reduce the position to absurdity by hypothetically granting the truth of what they're saying and showing, look, there's an inconsistency here. Um, I think that's a very helpful way. So, so people are saying, Hey, you know, Eric is bringing up these random examples of like these hypotheticals that are really unrealistic, but actually these hypotheticals are demonstrating the inconsistency of the standard of those who are arguing, uh, in favor of abortion, uh, you know, in different scenarios and things like that. I think that's an excellent kind of, uh, lesson in logical thinking and it's very useful um not just in in debates on abortion but just uh in anything when you're doing apologetics and things like that i think yeah. um that was excellent excellent illustrations and you know uh, uh, most of these if not all are not just you know kind of weird quirky scenarios some mm -hmm. of these are actual things yeah. that have actually yeah, happened yeah. so for example the whole thing about um you know the um and i'll have if you want, I can send you the, 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 the citations for it, but there was an instance where a woman who had, who was either getting an abortion or was undecided about keeping the baby did get in a car accident mm -hmm. and in her insurance policy, unborn children were covered under her insurance policy. So by, by claiming that by, by being pregnant, and showing that her baby died as a result of the car wreck, she was able to get lots and lots of money from the insurance because the other person who, who was at fault for the car wreck killed a member of her family. Wow.
Now, that, that that implicitly shows even inconsistency within the law because if this woman decides to not have the baby, well, it's no longer a family member and you can kill it. Right. Um, unfortunately, some some states have realized this inconsistency, and now uh, it's almost verbatim. The laws is now something like, well, it's a human person if the mother decides she wants to keep it. All right. Well, then it, you know, then it changes that. So right. yeah. So so these examples, I mean, they're they're while they are quirky and weird. Um, they, they're real life situations in many instances. And there's, there's right. so many other ones that, that of cases that have happened. You, <clears throat> no, no, I won't, won't go there. We'll just go for questions because there's yeah. a lot of interesting things. But what's, what is funny is that when you go to the other side, they do have these really weird, almost never in a million years would happen type of situations. Mm -hmm. Just about everyone I've mentioned have happened, but here's, here's an argument against abortion. It's called the violinist. Have you heard it? No. The violinist argument. No. Okay. <clears throat> And just oh, as a heads up, Eric, and just as a yes. heads up, Eric, after you make this point, I do want to go into the questions. And for this purpose, I don't want this to go too long for the reason that I actually want people to watch it. Some of my videos go up to like two hours. This, I think, is such an important conversation and you covered so much ground. I want to make sure that it's a sufficient length that some most people be comfortable kind of plowing through it because I think it's I think it's really important. So after this, we'll kind of move to the questions and, and wrap things up because I think you've captured very well the wide range of um, uh arguments and objections uh that we might encounter so i, I hope that's okay oh no yeah I, well i'll tell you what let's just go ahead and go to there and if we have time i'll cover that because it's it's an argument i'll have to first like explain and unpack okay. uh, um and since i haven't brought it up yet let's just go to the questions okay all right thank yeah. you for that and and again folks I, if you guys have been enjoying this conversation i mean it's very informative uh, i hope you're also thinking from an apologetics mindset don't just think of don't, don't just concentrate on the points he's making try to kind of pick up like the the mental route he's taking how he's rationalizing and thinking about these things that's a really good way to kind of practice thinking rationally and doing what we talk about a lot in this channel uh with res you know with respect to like presuppositionalism and stuff like that like internal critiques um so he's doing a very good job at internally critiquing a lot of these uh these pr perspectives so just keep that in mind all right so first question here is from jose rivera um, he asks, how would you answer, why does being made in the image of God give humans value? So if, if you were to say, hey, we're made in the image of God, and someone says, all right, cool, so what? What, is, what does that have to do with anything? Yeah, well, if I'm talking to a non-believer, I wouldn't necessarily use that argument. Okay. Um, because, uh, in other words, do I believe we're made in the image of God? Yes. Um, would I use that as an argument against the, the non-believer? No. And we, we may, you and I, Eli, may disagree here. You know, that's perfectly sure. fine. But um, I won't quote a Bible verse to an atheist, so to speak, because they don't believe the Bible. To me, at least, that's like quoting the Quran to make someone, you know, become a Muslim. If someone quotes the Quran to me, it's not going to make me, you know, drop to my knees and give my life to Allah. Um, how now, from a Christian perspective, well, I mean, obviously, we 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 trust in special revelation, sure. and and I mean, really, that's that's the the final authority. All we need to say is special revelation. What does God say about this? Um, mm -hmm. And of course, if God is a maximally perfect being, a maximally great being who has infinite value, then bearing His image gives us intrinsic value by virtue of the fact that we're made in his image. Uh, in other words, because he is so uh, uh, maximally great and perfect, then us even being uh, uh, having a part of him, if I can say that loosely, um, gives us that intrinsic value that separates us from anything and everything uh, else from creation. So that, that would be the nutshell there. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. Um, Jay asks, Eric, your atheist friend who is pro-life, what is the fundamental moral standard they are arguing from? Yeah, you know, I've, I haven't. So when I was talking to him, uh, we didn't go too much into that um, because yeah. one, I mean, I mean if, if an atheist is going to agree with me on something this important, I'm not going to try to, you know, um, argue him out of it because l let's say I convince him there's no moral standard. He's like, oh, okay, you're right. Well, then forget it, you know. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> okay. I, what I did instead... <laughs> yeah, what I did instead was just listen to him, you know, hear him out, which I think yeah. a lot of Christians don't do very well is they don't they they sure. they don't listen. Um sure. and I asked him, but I did ask him why. And it was interesting and without going to details and not that you know the person, but uh, he's a single father. And mm -hmm. basically, if I'm not mistaken, uh the I don't know if it was wife or girlfriend he was with, I, I think maybe didn't want to keep the child. I don't I don't want to get the details wrong, but sure. basically he said, look, have the baby and I'll, I'll, I'll take it. 
I'll, I'll take the baby. And he says his daughter's his best friend. So he's very much pro-life because of just how personal it is to him okay. and his story. All right. Thank you for that. Um, Neeland asks, uh, well, he well, makes a statement. Neeland makes a statement. We should just label people as eagles, then problem solved. Uh, it would be more yeah. safer as eagles. I think that's an interesting uh, point there. Yeah. Um, let's see here. Uh, Viet Mai uh, says, should abortion be criminalized? What if someone argues that abortion shouldn't be criminalized because women seek illegal means to abort the baby, which is harmful to women? Yeah, so um, when I spoke at uh, UT Dallas, where I did uh, the similar talk at a secular college campus, <coughs> one student came up to me and he said, look, I am pro-life like you. And he says, but if we don't keep abortions illegal, then women, because it's kind of a two-part question. Let me answer that one first. Sure. If the, um, then if women don't have access to legal abortions, they're, then they're going to seek abortions illegally, which can be harmful to women. Sure. So <clears throat> in the book that I'm writing on, on um, witnessing to non-believers, I, I kind of use as an example of how to use questions to, to implicitly make a point and even to kind of, you know, throw the ball back in their court. So the first thing I did was I rewarded his position. But I did it strategically. I, I pulled the fluff away from his question. And 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 it's not disingenuous because I really do want to make sure I understand a person before I answer them. So I said, before I answer your question, let me see if I if I understand your question correctly. Are you telling me that if we don't allow women to legally kill their unborn children, then they might harm themselves when they illegally try to kill their unborn children? Is that what you're asking? And he said, oh, that's a good point. And I said, well, well, I haven't made a point. I'm just making sure I understand <laughs> the question. I'm just repeating what you said. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm just, I'm just repeating what you said. I just, you know, take okay. away the <clears throat> And then I said, okay, but I said, but let's take this, do this. Let's take the principle of your argument and apply it to the different scenario. Because if you reject the principle for this scenario, then you're going to have to reject it for abortion as well. Okay. I said, let's suppose I were able to pull up all the statistics, you know, and show you here are the statistics of how many burglars are injured when they break into homes. You know, this guy in, you know, 2005, you know, lost his arm when he broke through the window. This guy, you know, broke his ankle when he jumped the fence. This guy got bit by a dog, yada, yada. And guess what? But if we, but they only hurt themselves because burglary is illegal. Now, if we legalize burglary, then these criminals won't hurt themselves. Now, do you agree with this argument? This was his response. He said, no, because they're just trying to hurt people. And I said, exactly. And what does abortion do? It doesn't just hurt someone, it kills someone. Right. So if you don't accept this principle for this argument, then it shouldn't apply to yours either. Right. Uh, now, should abortion be criminalized? Great question. So so first, l let me say this to, to those uh, pro-lifers and, and you know our, our Christian brothers and sisters who are listening. Before I answer the question, don't allow a separate issue to somehow serve or pretend to be a rebuttal to anything you've said. Okay. Because I can I can answer this one of two ways. Let's say I say should someone says, well, if you believe if you're against abortion, should it be criminalized? I could say, I don't know. But that doesn't answer the question of whether or not we're dealing with an unborn human person, because if we're dealing with an unborn human person, my argument stands and it's immoral and should be illegal. Okay. I mean, part me, in other words, these are two separate questions. My case against abortion does not stand or fall on me knowing whether or not it should be criminalized. Okay. Now that being said, um, if it, it, I think it should be made illegal, and if illegal, should it be criminalized? Probably. Mm -hmm. Now, here's here's the the um, disclaimer, if you will. Unfortunately, if you look at the statistics, most of the women, at least that have reported that we know of, because you always have those women who either don't report it or you know whatever, sure. um, they go through severe mental anguish, depression, um, you know. Uh, uh, regret over this decision. Um, so that's the first thing I'd say. Second, unfortunately, most women don't know what's going on or they don't understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. I've heard stories of women who've had abortions thinking it's, it's not a person. It's not a, it's not a human being. It's, it, it was only at the second week of yada, yada, yada. And they go hear a talk on abortion or they go or then read the literature for themselves and they just kind of die inside and say, yeah. I didn't know I was doing that. I, I didn't know that's what I did. Um, and to those believers listening, um, be gentle with 
people who have gone through this. It, right. It's let the Holy Spirit do the convicting. I put it that way, and we, let us do the loving. You know, when we we have someone who's gone through this, and I've always made a point to do that when I've done talks on that. You know, I'll I'll stop in the middle and say, look, if you've had one, I'm not here to condemn you or judge you. That's it's not my job. That's the Holy Spirit's job. Mm -hmm. But I am here to let you know that there's forgiveness that can only be found in Christ. Sure. And I make sure to emphasize that. Um, so I say that to say a lot of these women don't know what's going on. And, and really, uh, I don't know how many years ago the abortion rate really dropped drastically. And it wasn't because churches became better equipped to respond. It wasn't because apologists were just amazing at this. It was because of the invention of ultrasounds. Mm. And the invention of ultrasounds made it real and a vi gave a visual representation that you are killing an unborn human being that is still developing. So, sadly, if you go to some places, this might get your video demonetized, but if you go to somewhere like Planned Parenthood, <laughs> uh, if it's not as if it's not already going to be demonetized, like, um, <laughs> I've never had an abortion video monetized on my channel. But if you go to somewhere like Planned Parenthood, um, it is required. You have to do an ultrasound. Uh, mm -hmm. Even if you're going to go through an abortion, but what the doctors will often do is they will put the screen to where the woman can't see the screen. Mm -hmm. In other words, you legally have to do an ultrasound, but you're not mandated or obligated legally to show the woman her ultrasound. So mm -hmm. if they can hide the ultrasound for the woman, chances are she's going to go through with the abortion. So they just won't show the ultrasound. Oh. Do with that what you will. I mean, you know, it's 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 insane. So should it be criminalized? Yes, but I think. For sure, the person who should be punished are the doctors because there is no excuse and they know exactly what they're mm -hmm. doing. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes they recommend abortion either out of convenience or, you know, because if let's say the, the, the baby's health is, is, you know, at risk or questionable, if they do something wrong in a procedure to try to save the baby, you know, let's say they're afraid of getting sued. So instead they'll just say, ah, let's just go with the, a termination. Or selective right. termination in case of twins, and and it's it has nothing to do with whether or not it's a human person. It has to do with convenience for the doctor. And I think, yeah, the the doctors should be criminalized, absolutely for sure. All right, very good. Let's kind of shoot through some of these uh, a little bit quickly, as uh, but you don't don't feel rushed through any of the answers. I mean, answer it as full as you can. But if we can kind of do a rapid fire to make sure we get through all of them. Uh, Bubba's audio. That's a weird screen name. <laughs> Sorry. Hello, Bubba. How's it going? Uh, Bubba's audio, uh, has a question. I had someone tell me that someone is dead when they lose brain function. So in the same way, a thing is not alive until it has brain function. How would you respond to that? Uh, plants are alive. They don't have brain function. <laughs> um, jellyfish are alive. They don't have brain function. Um, now, it, now maybe maybe whoever they heard this from worded it differently. But but first, brain function is not necessary for being alive. Mm -hmm. um, you know, lots of things are alive without brains. Okay. Um, aside from that, uh, um, maybe what the person might be getting at is brain function is what makes you a human person. You know, we've already kind of discussed that. I don't know if Bubba's audio was working when we talked about that in the, <laughs> in the, in the beginning. Uh, sorry, uh, Bubba, your name just <laughs> invited. <that. laughs> I'm sorry. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, if I go into a coma, you know, I may have no brain function or whatever, uh, yeah. um, getting him in the head, whatever the case is, but brain function, going back to what I said earlier, function does not determine what you are, nor does it determine your value. Mm -hmm. uh, um, you as a human person is what determine, grounds your nature, and that is what determines the capacities you have. And there may be some instances where you lose these capacities due to, you know, it, in other words, I have the capacity to walk, but if you broke my spine, I would lose that capacity. So I've lost a function, but I have not lost my identity as a person or personhood. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, modern, uh, Caleb asks, how would you respond to the idea that a fetus before consciousness is just a lifeless body, like a body without a brain? If someone becomes brain dead, we allow doctors to let them die. <clears throat> so, so a few things, um, that kind of goes into what, what Bubba was asking. Um, but yeah, so consciousness again, is not a requirement for, for being a person or being alive. Uh, again, comas, uh, when you're put under anesthesia, you have no brain activity, you have no consciousness. Um, you know, in fact, uh, for certain procedures, um, cause I, I was just looking at an NDE, uh, a famous one. Um, I forget the, the, the woman's name, but basically, uh, they know she was like dead for sure because when they, yeah. when they put her under, um, when they put her under, they, the, the, the way the procedure was, they also, before doing that, they had to drain the blood 
out of most of her body because they had to do a certain proceed brain procedure. But as they were putting her under, they put in these uh, like headphones, if you will, that had a, a, a constant clicking sound and they okay. could measure the brain activity. Uh, uh, because in other words, if she could hear the clicking, even though she wasn't responding physically, they could tell that her brain was still active. So they put this ticking sound in her ear to make sure there was no brain activity. So it was verified that as long as the procedure took, there was no brain activity. So you can have no brain activity and be a lifeless body, and yet you're still a person. You know, they couldn't do whatever they wanted to her because they were doing a procedure on her and she was under anesthesia. Um, if someone becomes brain dead, we allow the doctors to let them die. Well, it so a few things. It the question becomes, and this would be beyond my what I know, um, is a person could a person temporarily be brain dead and then regain function? Well, if that's the case, well, then perhaps maybe they were dead and they were resuscitated. Mm. Um, or maybe they've just, again, something happened to where just like, again, anesthesia, you are you have no brain activity, but you're still there. They've just put you under um, coma. Same thing. <clears throat> um, however, on the other side, I will say this. Um, if if a person. As as going back to the soul stuff, um, as you know, I define the soul as an immaterial substance. Um Substances would be first movers. Uh, uh, you know, they respond to to environment and stimulation. So, if if a person's heart is still beating, even though they're unconscious, uh, and I'm just using one example, you know, then we know that the, the person's still there. But if you have a body where the only thing that is working and moving is due to a machine, if the machine is making my lungs move, if the machine is making my heart beat, and if the machine is doing everything, I would say the person's already gone. So it's not a matter of letting them die. They're already dead, and it's yeah. just a machine moving a corpse, so to speak. Sure. Um, yeah. So, so in those now, where does that line draw? That's that I don't ask me. You know that that would be for the for the uh, doctors to tell us. You know when that happens. But if by brain dead someone assumes they're dead, well then again they're not letting them die. They're already dead. Now again, this does not apply to uh, uh, a developing child because we know it is in a stage of developing. Um, it is in a stage of of continuing its growth and responding to its environment. It's alive. It, it, uh, um, it's 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 growing, and we know the end product of it. We know it's a human being. It's a unique individual human being. It's not the parents DNA. It's not the, the mother father's DNA. It's a different sex oftentimes than the mother. So we know this is a separate individual developing, living, growing human being, mm -hmm. which is far different than any of these things that we've talked about. All right. Excellent. Oh, well, I think that's, this is a good place to, to, to stop. Uh, I want to thank everyone who kind of sent in their questions. I do apologize if we didn't get to your question. Um, I think Eric, you did an excellent job that presentation. I, I might even just make a short, a little snippets from this interview because you there were some points where you just really kind of nailed a, a really important point down that I think would be useful for people to get. So um, hopefully this is not too long that people will see like, hey, an hour and twenty something minutes. I think I can do that. Very important topic, and I think Eric does a great job um, explaining how a Christian or anyone who is pro life might respond to. Uh, pro-choicers. So again, as first Peter chapter three, verse 15 tells us that um, when we are uh, being always prepared to give a reason for the hope that's in us, let us engage in these issues with gentleness and respect. I know it can be very difficult because of the nature of the topic, uh, but um, we honor Christ when we engage with uh, with those with whom we disagree, We when we do so in a way that uh, that honors Christ and is consistent with the scriptures that we're trying to defend. So, Eric, thank you so much for uh, coming on and explaining all this and taking questions. Um, is, is, are there any other resources that you could point people uh, to if they want to go deeper into um, defending um, the the pro-life position and maybe from a from a Christian perspective, I know that it, it can apply to non-Christians as well. Um, but what sort of resources can you point people to? Yeah. Um, so Scott Klusendorf, um, I forget the name of his ministry and hopefully he doesn't get mad at me for forgetting, but, uh, he, he does a great job. I mean, it, he has great resources. It's, uh, um, yeah, I would just, for the sake of time, look him up. Scott Klusendorf, uh, his ministry is, and of course, I don't see it when I Google his name. I just see articles about him. Uh, <laughs> um, I'll, have, I'll have to give them, but Scott Klusendorf does great stuff. He's done uh, quite a few debates on abortion. I would highly recommend checking out his content. Uh, Meg, Megan Alman, I think, she usually does uh, Biola on the Road, and she does great talks on abortion. Um, uh, Stand to Reason has great stuff on that. Uh, um, I, I know... Uh, 
Greg Kokel, you know, um, Tim Barnett, Alan Schleeman, all those other great guys, even some of the newer guys. And I don't know if they've done talks on abortion, but I, I know all these other guys have. In fact, when I was preparing for my debate, I kind of, you know, messaged them and, you know, was asking some questions in preparation. So any of those ministries would have uh, great resources uh, uh, for that. And I would also say, you know, to Christians, find a local crisis pregnancy center. Uh, um, and, you know, maybe you won't ever, you know, do a debate on abortion, or maybe you might not talk to someone who's who's uh, has a pro-abortion position, but you can go to your local pregnancy center, crisis pregnancy center, donate money, donate time, donate what they need. In other words, uh, uh, fight it on all fronts because we, we mm. need as, as all hands on deck as we can get. Mm, thank you for that. And folks, also um, Apologia Studios uh, with Jeff Durbin, his ministry, they're doing a lot of great work yeah. um, in this in this area. So you guys can definitely check out um, uh, the YouTube channel there and the website. So uh, but once again, Eric, thank you so much for your time. Guys who are listening in, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your time and sending in your questions. Life Life Training Institute. I just, I looked ah, at, okay. okay, I went to his Facebook profile. <laughs> ProLifeTraining.com, uh, president of Life Training Institute and author of The Case for Life. Right. Well, thank you for that. Um, we'll definitely check out those resources and and definitely subscribe to Eric's uh, YouTube channel. He's got a lot of great resources there. Um, and if you found this conversation helpful, please uh, share the video um, and um, have conversations with people and really engage um, on this very important uh, topic, but do so with gentleness and respect. Well, that's it for this episode, guys. Thank you so much. And once again, thank you so much, Eric. I appreciate your friendship and I appreciate learning from you. You've got a lot of great things to say. So God is definitely using you. And I hope that he continues to do so and that your ministry is a fruitful one. Amen.